You know, I, let me let me divert one more point. I was reminded this morning again. Wednesday night, we came down for Wednesday night service Wednesday night, and I, I just didn't feel good. I just didn't feel like it wasn't, it. I just, I don't know whether I was tired or what. But I came into Wednesday night service, and it was one of those nights that, you know, the preacher doesn't always want to go to church. Is that is that a revelation to you? Uh, the preacher doesn't always want to go to church. But it wasn't, I just, but I, and you know, as soon as I got here and we got with the people of God, I was just transformed. Just being, there's a ministry of presence. And just to be here together, it, it changes. And I just, that's the presence of Christ and the manifestation of His presence. I praise God for the body of Christ. I praise God for you. And I'm not saying this to be patronizing. I'm just saying you have no idea how much your presence means to the people around you. We are saved together. We are lost alone. Thank you, Lord for your presence with your people. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to look at a map that's going to put things in perspective for us, hopefully, and we're going to explore an event that occurred the night of Jesus' resurrection. You know, this is the first week after the resurrection. The Holy Spirit reminded me this morning as we were singing in the first service earlier today, that this was Thomas's spiritual awakening day. This was the day that Thomas came to true and full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection reality. And my prayer is the same thing will happen to us. Doubting Thomas changed to believing Thomas this day, this anniversary of the resurrection. And that night, that first night post-resurrection, there was an event that occurred, and we're going to look at the map, in a, in, in, on a journey to and in the village of Emmaus. You see it there on the map. It's north-northwest of Jerusalem. And we know from the Bible that it's seven miles away. And so we're going to hear an account of an encounter Jesus had with two of His disciples on that road to Emmaus. And our brother Jerry McDaniels is going to come read for us. Jerry? Reading out of Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. The same day two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God had kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walked along? They stopped short sadness written across their face. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened these last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man of Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We have hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. All of this happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people! You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the Scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering into His glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and the prophets, explaining from all of the Scriptures the things concerning Him. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of the journey. Jesus acted, acted as if He was going on, 
but they begged him to stay the night with us since it was getting late. So he went home with them. And as he sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scripture to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them. Mm. The word of God. This account is fascinating. And it never gets old. It's frankly one of the most humorous passages in the Bible. You know, the Bible is full of humor and we miss it. I once read a book years ago written by a Bible scholar and he pointed out the humorous things in the Bible and a lot of Jesus' teaching to the people he was addressing would have been funny. Humor is cultural. It's also generational. There are a lot of things that I think are funny and my children look at me like i got two heads. <laughs> because they don't see it as funny and vice versa. And so 2,000 years removed from the time of Jesus, we miss the humor in the Bible. And this is one of those passages that even today I think is funny. I mean, Jesus is walking along the road on this seven-mile hike with these two believers on the night of the resurrection, and they look at him with this line, Are you the only one in Jerusalem that is clueless? I think that's hilarious. I can't imagine Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you idiot, what are you thinking? You know, I mean, that's, that's to me. I mean, he held himself, obviously. But he's the only one who had any clue what was going on. They were obviously clueless, not him. It was funny. I also uh, can't think of this powerful account without remembering the event in my life many years ago. And the more amazing thing about this is this occurred on a weekday of the same week I was preparing to preach from this passage. Back in about 1985, I had a youth pastor in Georgia where I served at our church. Our youth pastor needed a, a ride from the airport at 11.30 plane arrival at night. So I went to pick him up. Well, it's 11.30 at night. I don't want to be at the Atlanta airport. I want to be home in bed. So I'm stumbling through security and everything else. And as I was going through, everybody was always motioning around me to somebody, and I'm oblivious. So finally, I get on the the train to go out to the concourse and you know how you hold the bar and there's like four of us on the train two guys standing there holding the bar with me another guy sitting here <clears throat> the guy sitting here points to the guy next to me and says a name and finally I look around and I'm leaning holding the bar and then leaning on Ray Charles <laughs> the Ray Charles and I'm clueless I am completely clueless and so about the time I, whoa, that's Ray Charles. And, and, I'm, and about the time I'm, I'm ready to try to say something, the train stops and he gets off and gets, gets on his exit. But I, I think of that and it reminds me so much of this event with these disciples on the road to Emmaus with Jesus. Question. Question. You know, Jesus used questions on the road to Emmaus. Questions are far more important than answers. Far more important. I would far rather be able to ask right and fruitful questions than to give right answers. Far more important. I'm, I'm more interested in you discovering the truth for yourself and equipping you to do that than me telling you what to believe. Now, I don't want you to believe I'm a liar. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want, that's not, but my greater agenda and goal is to stimulate you to seek yourself and to discover the truth about Christ and to be an instrument to try to stimulate that. And I don't think there's anything that does that better 
than right questions. Jesus was the expert at questions. Read the accounts of Jesus' life. He frequently answered questions with questions. Karen Maines years ago said, the thing that has made the difference in my life are not the answers I've been given, but the questions I've been asked. Hallelujah. That's a great truth. And on this road to Emmaus, Jesus is asking strategic questions. And he is even provoking them. Notice how it said when they got to their destination that Jesus pretended to go further. He was trying to provoke them to initiate an invitation, which he knew was consistent with the mores and moral values, social mores of the day, because it was the ultimate insult not to entertain a hospitability to a stranger, hospitality. And so Jesus was playing on that. So questions matter. Question then of th this account, which, which part of the journey to Emmaus describes your walk with Christ, your walk with Jesus? Are you typically confused, unbelieving, and defeated, and discouraged? That would be on the way to Emmaus. Or are you typically full of uncontainable joy at the thought of Jesus and ultimately engineer everything in life around Him? That would be on the way back from Emmaus. I want to tell you that I spend personally far too much time on the way to Emmaus. I spend far too much time and I spend far too many days on the way to Emmaus. And I want to be on the way back from Emmaus. <laughs> Especially as my chronological characteristics increase. That's a fancy way of saying as I'm getting older. <laughs> I remember as a younger man being frustrated with my parents. I'd say, well, let's do this, let's do this. Listen, we just need to rest a minute. We just need... I'm, I had no sympathy for that whatsoever. I had no appreciation for... Anybody here with me? I had no appreciation. I am empathetic beyond description now. <laughs> and here's these guys that have... I don't know what they did the rest of the day, but obviously it was a full day. The resurrection, everybody's going nuts, what's going on? And I don't know when they came from Emmaus, but I know when they went home, they went home that night. And they walked seven miles. If they had a step counter, they got all their steps in. <laughs> and they get to Emmaus, and all of a sudden, they get up, and they, that same night, go back. My math's not real good, but I got 14 figured out. And 14 miles is a long way in one day. And they hustle back that night to Jerusalem, and they don't go to bed when they get there, they're sharing the good news. Jesus is alive. Listen, I want to live on the way back from Emmaus. And my prayer is today that the consequence of our exploration and exposure to this event in the life of Jesus will put us on the way back from Emmaus starting today. Well, what made the difference? What made the change? Well, Jesus tried to enlighten them with the Word of God. And they reflected and they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? You know, it's amazing if you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you read the accounts in the Bible of people who have had some sort of an encounter with God, some sort of, of manifest encounter with God, not all the time, but almost exclusively, at the time it happened, they didn't know it was going on. They didn't know it was happening. 
at the time it happened. It was almost always after the fact that they realized, wait a minute, that was God. That was God. And so these guys are walking along and Jesus is opening up the entire Old Testament to them. Wouldn't you love to have a copy of that Bible commentary if it were written? And Jesus opened up the entire Old Testament to them, and they said, you know, as he did that, our hearts burned within. But they still were fuzzy. They, they were foggy. They didn't get it. But in retrospect, they knew they should have, but they had missed it. But then, what made the difference? Well, when Jesus sat with them that night at the table, and he broke bread with them, and by the way, the language there is eerily similar to the language of Jesus around the table at the Last Supper when, we, when He instituted um, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. The language is, is parallel. And Jesus had said He broke bread, and when He did that, they were aware they were in the presence of Jesus. And that's what made the difference. It was simply this. They understood Jesus was in the room with them. That changed them from confused, frustrated, fearful, to confident, certain, energetic Christ followers who got up and made it back to Jerusalem that night. They were instantly transformed all because they understood they were in the presence of Jesus. The presence of Jesus made all the difference. What would that do in your life? The realization of the presence of Jesus. What, would, what change would that make? If you realized, it's like somebody said one time, if you realized Jesus was sitting on the couch with you, would you watch what you watch on television? <laughs> if you realized Jesus was in the room and part of the conversation, would you speak to your spouse the way you spoke to them? If we realize Jesus is in the room, how will we respond to Him? I can't, I've shared before, some of you may remember a story from my childhood that I don't remember, but my mother related it, saying that she had taken me to the doctor. I was four or five years old, and there were several normal doctor visit procedures that he needed to perform but all of them involved some sort of pain. And I wasn't happy about that and wasn't shy about voicing my disapproval. And finally, the doctor looks at me and says, if you don't hush, your mother is going out of this room. Mother relates the story that at that point, I completely clammed up, every tear dried, I didn't even murmur. He could have cut my leg off. I didn't say a word. You know why? Because as long as mama's in the room, I'm going to be okay. And I instinctively knew it. And I was more afraid of her leaving than anything he could even try to do to me. What would it do to us if we understood Jesus was in the room and nothing happens to us without His permission? and that He's in control, what would that do to us? The now late Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, former president of Asbury College, he died about a week ago, 95 years old. Dr. Kinlaw related the story of the great Asbury revival of 1970 when after a student got up and began to confess his sins on chapel service on a Tuesday morning and talked about what a hypocrite he was, he knew all the Christianese, he'd been around the church, he knew how to pretend being a Christian, and he confessed, I'm a hypocrite, I'm a fraud, and I confess before God and you this day that I repent, and the Spirit of God fell on that place, and that meeting ended eight days later, 24 hours a day, never stopped. No human ever led the service. No person was in charge. The Holy Spirit orchestrated. There were never less, any hour of the day, there were never less than hundreds of people in the auditorium, and people would pray and seek God 
and kneeling at the front for hours on end to seek the face of God. It was an amazing thing, carried on television news reports. This was in the, this was in the days when they were burning college campuses and tearing them down. Some of us are old enough to remember that. And Dr. Kinlaw came in. He was in Banff, Alberta, Canada, when news arrived that the revival had broken out. He came in two days later, and he was driving back after a late flight, and about midnight he was getting to town, and he said that he sensed something, a presence that he normally didn't sense. And so instead of walking in and announcing himself at midnight, he just inconspicuously slipped in the back of the chapel to observe what was going on, to figure out what is this. A day or so later, a newspaper reporter asked him, what's going on at your college campus? And he said, all I can tell you is this, is that Tuesday morning, the Lord Jesus walked in the room and his people have been paying him homage ever since. The presence of Christ the realization of the presence of Christ. Now, let's look at a passage with which many of us are probably already familiar, maybe, probably, but let's look at it in a little different angle that I think helps reinforce the truth that we discover in Luke 24. And that passage is Matthew 28. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared on and off for 40 days to his disciples at different points of time. And Matthew, in recording those appearances, he records these as the final words of Jesus found in Matthew 28, 20. Let's read them together. And remember, I am with you each and every day until the end of the age. Those are the last words that Matthew records of Jesus. Now, If you are perhaps familiar with that verse, you probably are familiar with it being rendered, remember I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that's not wrong, but it's not, doesn't really give the emphasis that the original has that this particular translation brings out. Here's the way Matthew originally wrote it word for word. I am with you all of the days until the end of the age. And that's the reason this translation, and I think it catches the strength of what was actually said by Jesus in a way that the others miss, is this translation emphasizes that the emphasis there of Jesus was every day from now till he returns and sets up his kingdom and the consummation of the age Each and every day, I'm going to be present with you. There's not going to be a moment, there's not going to be a day that I'm not going to be present. Our lives are lived in days. Tomorrow is not here yet. Yesterday is gone. All we have is now. Every day all we have is now. And Jesus says, every day I'm with you. Now, I'm saying then that based on that, on the words of Jesus himself, that every day we walk the Emmaus Road. Every day. And how many of us walk as if we were on the way to Emmaus all the while Jesus is there and we're clueless? We ignore him at worst and we miss him at best. But the reality is, according to Jesus, there's not a moment of any day or any place you go that Christ is not there with you, that he's not in the room. There's a lady that my wife and I met, and actually her son told me this fascinating story first, But after I heard him tell it, the next time I saw her, I asked her to repeat it because I wanted the first-hand account because I felt it was such a remarkable story. This lady grew up in Morocco on the coast of North Africa 
in Morocco, in her hometown growing up, was Marrakesh. Marrakesh, Morocco. She's a Jewish lady. She's a Sephardic Jew who grew up in Marrakesh, and her family was evidently quite wealthy. They had servants and so forth and so on. And she had an, an idyll, idyllic childhood. And she told the story that in the late 1950s, she was, I don't know, 10 years old, 12 years old, somewhere in that range, in the late 1950s. And every day she would walk to school by the same route. And for a period of time, as she would walk, and she walked past the same hotel every day, and there was an elderly man there painting with an easel painting when she would walk by and she would stop as a 10 year old who's outgoing might do and just chat with the fellow and they would chat with each other and he was very friendly and this went on for a number of days they would interact together and finally one day she was coming home from school and it just occurred to her she invited this man home for dinner would you come home to, to supper with my family and I? Sure, I'd love to come to your house for supper. So he gets up, puts up his easel, and walks with her. They head to her house. She said in retrospect, of course, she's 10, 11, whatever years old, and she remembers there being a couple people following them from behind, but it wasn't like paying attention. She gets home and gets to the door and calls for her parents. Her father comes to the door, sees her and the man with her, and he freaks and she said, he started speaking Arabic to me so the man wouldn't understand, and he is really chewing me out. What are you doing doing this to me? Yada, yada, yada. You're embarrassing us. You, you should have let me know. We sh you should have told us. The man she had invited home for supper who came with her was Sir Winston Churchill. <laughs> the Sir Winston Churchill. And if you check it, it stands because he loved Morocco. In fact, during the great Yalta conference with Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill, Churchill later took Roosevelt to Marrakesh while they were there because he said, man, you've got to see Marrakesh. <laughs> and they actually went on a little holiday there together. So Churchill loved Marrakesh, and he was an avid painter. And what, what an amazing story. And the father was upset because, I mean, if you know Churchill's coming for supper, not only do you want to clean the house, you probably want to know six months in advance so you can remodel it. <laughs> right? But the fact is that that story, I think, stands as an icon of our life. Because I believe that Every day, we have an opportunity to talk to royalty and to entertain royalty, and we're clueless. Why did Jesus leave us the promise, I'm with you each and every day till the end of the age? Because He wants us to know He's not only alive, but He's always in the room. And He knows Living in the reality of His presence is the key to living the victorious life that He died and rose to share with us. Every day, every day, according to Jesus, we entertain royalty and for the most part, we're unaware. I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to live on the way back from Emmaus every day until the end of my age. And I want to live like Jesus is in the room and I'm more aware of Him than anybody else. And I believe that Jesus made that possible. What about you?